Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Vivek Dieri, Nornor, Rosa, Rosa. French Leo, Nitesh. Okay, good, good. My bad, my bad. That was my bad. I didn't start uh, the computer properly this morning. Thank you, guys. Good morning, Ashley. Kishore, MVVM, MVC, Floyd. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on what time it is in your part of the world. Javier, good morning. Uh, Rosa, you asked a question. Can we say he or she or I was a patient patient? Can you say they were a patient patient? Of course you can. The first patient is an adjective. It means you can wait. The second patient in that sentence is a noun. It means somebody who's being taken care of by a doctor. So you can say, yeah, they were a patient patient. He was a patient patient. She was a patient patient. I was a patient patient. Javier, it's 934 in Colombia. Well, that's not so crazy. Just a couple hours ahead of uh, us here in Spokane, Washington. Beautiful downtown Spokane, Washington. 1134 in Brazil, where you are, Renata. Uh, that's getting a little farther into the future. Almost noontime. 1529 in Algeria. Uh, is that Greenwich meantime, or is that 330? Is it 330 there now? Crazy, crazy about all the times. Good morning, Vivian. Good morning, Bharat. Good morning, Ali. 1735 in Qatar. Oh, you're making me do math. 535, 535. 20 in India. 8, 8 o'clock p.m. in India. We're getting later as we're going around the world. So if you're wondering, if you're watching this video on the YouTube channel and you're wondering who am I talking to when we do these videos live there's a chat room and there a lot of people join so when I say something like hi Tatiana it's an actual person it's not just a, an imaginary friend hello Hisham yeah okay no math I promise no math today only English you would not want me as an English teacher or tutor. Math is difficult. Math is difficult. Okay, let's look. <laughs> let's look. Good, Louise. How are you doing? It's going good. It's going good here. Uh, let's look at these links, as always. And I'll go through these fast because I know for those of you who join, Every week, you hear the same information, but if you have any more information about these classes, you can contact Zach up in Canada at Zach at SmartEnglish.com. There is no A in smart. It's SMRTEnglish.com. Now, the real word, word smart, of course there's an A, but for Smart English, no A. Good morning, everybody. Oh, I'm glad. If this is your first time, I'm glad you could join us. Today, we will be talking about auxiliary verbs. But first, the links. If you are interested in subscribing to any of the classes, which gives you full access to the SMART curriculum, you can pick the class that's right for you. You can pick pre-intermediate English, with Abby, which is our beginner class, intermediate with Sean, upper intermediate, that's me, that's the class that's going on right now, or English for academic purposes with Josh. If you would like to know more about the physical location where we work, where Josh and I and Abby work, you can click this link and see the Spokane College 
of English language. Check out the web page, check out this website. Lots of useful information. It can tell you a lot more than I can at this time. Uh, if you want to join our Facebook group, it is Learn English on Facebook with SMART. Once again, that's S-M-R-T, SMART. And finally, if you would like to watch an old video, you can go to our YouTube channel. And here's all the old links. Hi, There's Sean. Today on this beautiful I'm going to pause Sean there uh, because I'm still presenting. Mayara, welcome, welcome. And Tatiana, welcome to your first class. Vivek, you're an imaginary person. Somehow, I always suspected you may be an imaginary person. All right, my name is Neil Hallgarth. As always, I haven't changed my name yet. Barat, I don't know when Nicole will be back. I don't know when Nicole will be back. I miss her too. Actually, not really. I work with her, so I see her all the time. Uh, I don't know when she'll be back to teach a class. Maybe I will ask her to substitute one of my classes. I'll see how she feels about that. Good morning, Tushara. Good morning, Ellie. Good morning, everyone. Okay, at the beginning, in the notes, and maybe I'll share the class notes one more time, that link in the chat room will link to these class notes that I will sometimes have in the background here behind me. And uh, if you're on your computer, you can click that link and see these class notes. Hello, Mohammed. Okay, let's get ready. Uh, I said, at the beginning, I said right off the bat, I use this expression all the time. It is a baseball expression. The bat is the thing they use to hit the ball in baseball. And it means uh, first thing, uh, right off the bat, uh, the beginning thing. It's an idiom. It's kind of slang right off the bat. The first thing. Hello, Waddington. Hopefully I said all my hellos this morning. So many people joining us. It's great. It's great to see all of you here, actually. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, what else did I say? Uh, when Vivek said he was always an imaginary person, we have uh, an ex another expression, imaginary friend. And this is something that children often have. Children often have an imaginary friend. Uh, a person that exists only in the mind. A pretend person. So when Vivek said he was imaginary, somehow I said, somehow I always suspected. Thought. Uh, suspect is like thought, but thought something was not quite right. And that's a verb past tense and also uh, can be an adjective. Now let's just say uh, I always suspect it. Hello, Chris. Wow. Imad, hello. More people are joining us. Blue guitar. Uh, what's the difference? Blue Guitar is asking the question, what's the difference between an idiom and a slang? Actually, right off the bat is an idiom. It's something, it's a, co it's a word or combination. Oh, it's always a combination of words. It's a phrase, a combination of words that make sense within a culture. They make sense within a culture. If you take an idiom and you try to understand it one word at a time, you look up each word in the idiom and you try to make sense of it, it won't make sense. Uh, it is something that has gained meaning.
that has meaning because of history and use in English, but on its own, it doesn't really make much sense. When I say something like, I felt like a fish out of water, it sounds kind of funny. A fish out of water, what does that mean? Does that mean I'm dying? I'm not getting enough oxygen? Actually, the term, and let me blow this up a little bit, uh, maybe not that much. Uh, the term fish out of water simply means uh, a person who is in a new and unfamiliar place. If you've ever traveled to a different country, you may have felt like a fish out of water at least at first. Right off the bat, you may feel like a fish out of water. And those are idioms. Those are idioms. They have a specific use within a culture and they have a specific meaning. Good, Louise, that's perfect. Like, bark up the wrong tree. Bark up the wrong tree. Uh, you, uh, a person, when a person tries the wrong method to accomplish a goal, uh, an unsuccessful, uh, what can we say, an unsuccessful effort. Don't bark up the wrong tree. It will be unsuccessful. All of your efforts will be for nothing. Yes, I am out, Natesh Good, out of my comfort zone. It's like being a fish out of water. Comfort zone is like where you feel comfortable. So all of these so far is, okay, so Rosa, homesick. Homesick is an acceptable word. I, it's in the dictionary. A lot of things that start off as idiom or slang often find their ways into the dictionary. Of course, homesick means uh, missing home. It simply means that homesick. Boy, that's a good question. Is that a slang or an idiom? Uh, I would say it's more idiomatic, uh, but it's become such an acceptable word. Uh, it's even hard for me to think about the word homesick not being a real word. But because it's so strange, like homesick, what does that mean? That you are sick of home? That you want to leave home? No. It means that you feel kind of sick, maybe in the head, maybe even physically because you are away from your home. Homesick. Good, couch potato, couch potato. So far all of these are more idiomatic. That's right, sure, a lazy person. Man, a lot of them, a lot of them. Paint the town red. Have a fun night out. So, green with envy. Uh, green with envy. Feeling very envious of someone else. Okay, so obviously you know what idioms are. So what is slang? What is really slang? And we often group idioms and slang together because you have to really be a part of culture to understand the use of idiom or slang, but a slang is more something like, oh, uh, let's see, now I have to think. Oh, okay. Um, I'm going to give you an example sentence. I have a lot of cheddar. The word cheddar really means a type of cheese. But if I said something like this, I have a lot of cheddar, doesn't really make sense to say I have a lot of cheese. It means money. Cheddar is slang 
for money. At least it used to be. It's kind of older slang now. You don't hear that a lot anymore. But uh, sometimes one word can replace another word, and that takes on a kind of a popular meaning. For a short time, it's hard to tell if slang will be a fad or a trend. Will it be a fad uh, for a sh uh, something popular for a short time? Or will it be a trend, something popular for a long time? Will it be a fad or a trend? So obviously, cheddar was a slang that was more of a fad. It didn't really last. Uh, people don't say it anymore. But at one point, it was slang for money. It was a replacement word for money. Time is money. Uh, Kishore, you're asking, uh, time is money. Is it an American slang? It's an idiom. Time is money. It's a saying. Uh, it might even be like a maxim or a proverb. Uh, because it's so, it has become so used and so well known, and it's thought to have a more profound meaning, even if it doesn't. Time is money. Uh, it means that basically time is valuable. If you waste time, you lose money. Time is money. Vivek Fat Cat. Fat Cat. Uh, a fat cat is someone with a lot of money and power, I guess we could say. A fat cat. Yes, Leo. So that's another slang for money. Good. Green is another slang. The slang meaning, you know green is a color. Of course, that's the real meaning. The slang meaning of green is money. So we take, sometimes for slang, we take an existing word that has one meaning and we use it to replace another word. We give a word a new meaning. We give it a new context and a new meaning. We have completely, Good, Rose. I noticed you. We have completely changed the subject we're talking. Uh, Bushra, a bonehead move. Uh, a bad decision. A bonehead move. If you, if you are a bonehead, you are not very smart. Whew, so much. In fact, you guys are writing so much, it looks like you are very comfortable with slang and idioms. Okay, let's get to the real topic. And there's a lot more. You, you have very, very good examples of both slang and idioms. I can't get to them all. Uh, let's get to the, yes, let's get to the auxiliaries. I agree. Okay, auxiliary verbs. And I'm going to go to the presentation one more time. I will share the class notes in the chat room with you. I'm going to go to the presentation. We got to go fast. There are three, count them, three auxiliary verbs in the English language. Be, do, and have. Now you know all of the auxiliary verbs in English. There are only three of them. Let's start with be. Be is used with a verb ending in ing to make continuous forms. You may have also heard these as progressive forms. So continuous or progressive forms of verbs start with a be verb, or sorry, be auxiliary verb, then are followed by a verb, and that verb will end in ing. You will put an ing ending. All continuous sentences need the auxiliary verb be. Please, when you're writing an auxiliary sentence, don't forget the auxiliary verb. Never forget the auxiliary verb. They are super, super important. 
Isbell, thank you for joining us. No, today's class is not about idioms. It's about auxiliary verbs. We just got sidetracked. We got sidetracked. We started talking about a new topic because it seemed to gain popularity in the chat room. There was a, a trend in the chat room to share idioms. Thank you, Anamora. I, I appreciate I appreciate all the compliments. I appreciate appreciate you being here with me for this lesson on auxiliaries. We've wasted a lot of time and time is money, so let's go fast. Let's go through these examples fast. The man is educating us with his experience and wisdom. This is present continuous. How do I know it's present? To know if it's present, past, or future, I should look at the auxiliary verb. Here, the auxiliary verb is a form of the be verb. The form of the be verb is, 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 is. So the man is educating us with his experience and wisdom. The verb with the ing ending, and here we took the verb educate, deleted the e, got rid of the e, and added ing instead, is will always be the same, whether it's past, present, or future, you will always have a verb ending in ing. The thing you look at to see what tense it is, what verb tense it is, is the auxiliary. You have to look at the be verb, is, so present continuous. The man is educating us with his experience and wisdom. So when we look at this next sentence, how do we know it's past continuous? we look at the be verb and the be verb here is was was she was relying too much on her parents money when she started university she was relying too much on her parents money when she started university past continuous was and yes barat this is my second video on auxiliary verbs you may have seen me talk about the subject before. So why talk it about it again? Because it is so important. It is so important that you know, you study, you use your auxiliary verbs. In English, verb tense tells people about not only what the agent or the subject of the sentence is doing or feeling, or it's not only describing them, uh, it is also telling us what time it happened and how long it happened. And sometimes it even explains why something happens. So, so much meaning is packed into verb tenses. It's very important to know these. And auxiliary verbs are very important to verbs and verb tenses. So, I will probably do another one on auxiliary verbs. I cannot talk enough about auxiliary verbs. Rosa, are modal verbs auxiliaries? Uh, no, although for the future tense, we do need the modal will. We need the modal verb will for future tenses, even when we have an auxiliary. Uh, they're both helping verbs. Modals and auxiliaries are both helping verbs, but they're a little different. So I consider auxiliaries and modals to be two different topics, to be two different topics, but they both help the main verb. Hi, English English, I like your name. Okay, more examples. Now we have present perfect continuous. I have been saving my photos in this album. So for the present perfect, because it's perfect, we need have, and that's our auxiliary, then if it's continuous, anytime you have perfect continuous, you're going to need this exact word, been, B-E-E-N, for the present perfect continuous. Or, yes, or for the past perfect continu continuous, or for the future perfect continuous, you need been. So, I have been saving my photos in this album. And again, this is our main verb. It's the verb save. We deleted the E and added ING. I have been saving my photos in this 
album. He will be contributing by helping to make dinner. Future continuous. And here we need a modal. So, Rosa, you will see a modal on some of these verb tenses. Uh, the modal will, of course, is needed for future tense. Will be contributing. Here, our auxiliary be will just stay be because every time you have a modal verb, the verb after the modal verb has to be infinitive. It has to be verb form number one. If you have a verb after a modal, that verb has to be verb one. So here we have, he will be contributing by helping to make dinner. Finally, infinitive continuous. The lights are off in their house. They must be sleeping. So we've used a modal. Again, we've used a modal. This time, must. Remember, any time you use a modal, the verb after has to be the infinitive form. Verb number one. They must be sleeping. And here, of course, is the verb sleep followed by ing. So we always need this ing verb, saving, contributing, sleeping. If we have present perfect, have been. If we have future, will be. If we have an infinitive, because we used a modal, must be. And those are continuous forms. And we always need a form of the be verb if we're going to write a continuous verb form. Been, be, was, is, are, am. Always, always, always. Okay, be is also used with past participles to make passive sentences. Past participles to make passive sentences. Uh, Ro uh, Rosa, yes, auxiliary verbs are a type of helping verb. The other type of helping verb are modal verbs. And we'll talk about modals again later. A modal, uh, De Jesus, uh, we'll talk about modals. I'll, I'll do another modal lesson in the future. So in the future, we will talk about modals. Okay. Um, Kishore, uh, you say uh, after two. Okay, so a bare infinitive. Maybe you saw this one. They must be sleeping. So here we have an infinitive form, and it's not followed, or it's, yeah, the word two doesn't come before. A modal comes before. That's, uh, sometimes you don't need the word two. The word two and an infinitive is an infinitive phrase. And not all infinitive verbs will be in that type of infinitive phrase. Sometimes we have bare infinitives after like a sense verb. Sometimes we have an infinitive after a modal. You don't always need the word to to create an infinitive, to create an infinitive. A modal can create an infinitive. And also there are cases of a bare infinitive that doesn't use the word to. So it comes up a couple other times in English. Okay. Hi, Muhammad. Just talking about auxiliary verbs. Uh, oh, after to. So anytime you have an infinitive verb after to, that's an infinitive phrase. And it happens in things like uh, verb patterns. It happens... Uh, it happens a lot in sentences where you will need an infinitive phrase. I'll have to talk about that. It's another topic I'll have to talk about later. It's too big to cover. Uh, okay, so Kishore, that's what I thought. Your example is called a verb pattern. Another topic for the future. Verb patterns would be a lesson on its own. So we'll talk about all of this stuff later. For now, let's look at auxiliaries in use in verb tenses. 
she is being educated by a wonderful teacher. Okay, this is a passive sentence. A passive sentence is where the subject or the agent of the sentence, actually it's not the agent, it's just the subject of the sentence is not the agent, when the subject is not the agent, meaning she is not educating herself. She is not doing this verb. The teacher is doing this verb. So this is a passive sentence. If you make a passive sentence, you're going to need auxiliary be. And this is present, continuous, passive. And the be here gets the ing. She is being educated by a wonderful teacher. So uh, we have auxiliary be, then the verb being, which we need to make this passive form, and then verb number three. She is being educated by a wonderful teacher. And here we have by to tell us who is actually doing this action, who is doing this verb. Past simple passive, the body was preserved by special medical techniques. Here we have past form of be, was, and then verb three, preserved. Here we don't need being because this is just past simple passive. It's not continuous, it's simple. The body was preserved by special medical techniques. And here this by tells us what is doing the preserving. Yes, King Killa, we will talk about essays in the future. Right now, uh, only auxiliaries today. Uh, Ali, you're wondering when we use being without uh, auxiliary be. Uh, we can use being without auxiliary be if we use it as a gerund, if we use it to begin a gerund phrase. Uh, like being a teacher is fun. So ing words are also used as gerunds, and gerunds go into a noun position in a sentence. We can also talk about gerunds in a future topic. Okay, let's go. Next, next. All right, uh, boy, lots of, lots of questions. I'm just gonna stick to auxiliaries for now because of the time crunch. We're in a time crunch, crunch now. The house has been destroyed. Present perfect passive. We have has, auxiliary has, because it is perfect form. Been, because it's a passive form, working with the verb three destroyed, the past participle destroyed. Present perfect passive. The house has been destroyed. So here, this present perfect passive tense needs two auxiliaries. It needs two auxiliary verbs. Okay, the next one. My car will be repaired this weekend. Future passive. Will, of course, showing us future. Be, remember, always infinitive form of verb after a modal. Then verb three, or past participle, because this is a passive form. My car will be repaired this weekend. Your homework needs to be done before class. Infinitive, and here we have an infinitive phrase. Needs to be done. Needs to be done. And this is verb three, past participle. Your homework needs to be done before class. Notice all these sentences don't have the by. The house has been destroyed. I don't know, by fire, by an earthquake? Here, the writer thought, not important, just focus on the house. The house has been destroyed. My car will be repaired this weekend. By who? By a mechanic, I assume. So it's not important. So we didn't say by da da da, by somebody. Your homework needs to be done before class. By who? By you, of course. We already know by who. So nothing there. Okay, let's go to do. Next auxiliary, do. <coughs> 
Kishore, what is the difference between simple past and present perfect tense? A lot. A lot is different. Simple past will use, if you have an auxiliary in simple past, it will be was. Uh, and present perfect, you will need the auxiliary have or has. And then your be auxiliary will be been. So a lot of differences, a lot of differences. Uh, here are, and Rose is sharing them, here again are uh, some class notes for this lesson. Okay, do, let's look at auxiliary do. Do, does, or did are used in the present or past simple tenses. Present or past simple tenses. Generally, they are used mainly in questions and negative sentences, not so much positive sentences. Let's take a look at some examples. Examples. Where did you grow up? Where did you grow up is a question. Past, obviously past question. They don't do that in my country. Do and not, which is negative. Do or not, which is negative. And of course, this is the contraction for do not, D-O-N apostrophe T. Don't forget the apostrophe before that final letter T. They don't do that in my country. Now notice we have don't do, don't do. Yes, you can have do twice in a sentence. If one is negative and one is positive, does he understand? Question, here we use the D-O-E-S, does form because it's he. He, she, or it will use does. And then finally, another past negative, she didn't come to school yesterday. So you can have present negative or you can have past negative. And Kishore, we're not really talking about situational use today. We're just talking about form, grammar form. In the future, we can talk about use, when you would use these situations for use. But here we're talking about form. So this is more when you're writing. Of course, you can use this when you're speaking as well. But here we're concentrating on grammar form, which is more of a written form of it. Uh, can we use do and past verb together, De Jesus? Uh, I'm going to say no. No. Off the top of my head, I can't think of an example. So I'm going to say no to that question. Okay. Do, does, or did are also used to express emphasis. Emphasis is when you really want to make a point. You really want people to focus on what you write or what you say. You want to highlight it. You want to make it noticeable to somebody else. So the auxiliary do is used for emphasis. Emphasis. Let's look. I usually don't care much about celebrities, but I do follow Brad Pitt. So this is emphasis. I'm pointing out an exception. I usually don't care much about celebrities, but I do follow Brad Pitt. You are making sure that the person understands that even though you usually don't care about celebrities, there is one that you do care about. And that's Brad Pitt. Who, who doesn't follow Brad Pitt? Who doesn't care about Brad Pitt? I usually don't care much about celebrities, but I do follow Brad Pitt. And of course, I'm exaggerating the emphasis in my voice. But oftentimes when people say these sentences, there will be uh, a vocal emphasis on that word, on that word. She said, I didn't eat breakfast, but I did eat breakfast. Here we use the auxiliary did to emphasize, to make our point, to make the person understand that they are wrong. 
She said, I didn't eat breakfast. But she's wrong. I did eat breakfast. So if you want to correct somebody, if they are wrong about something, you can use auxiliary do for emphasis to say, hey, you're wrong. I did eat breakfast. And usually we don't use auxiliary do with the positive, but here we're using it with a positive sentence. Eat breakfast. I did eat breakfast. Oftentimes we hear young people, like kids, use this, use the emphasizing do. I did clean my room. I did take out the garbage. I did do my homework. So it can be used in a positive sentence as emphasis. Okay. Good, Rosa. Good example. Rosa has the example sentence, you didn't hear me, but I did tell you. Even if you didn't hear me, I did tell you. Good, French Leo. I'm glad to hear you say that. French Leo says, I do believe in myself. You say I don't believe in myself, but I do believe in myself. Okay, let's do for emphasis. More examples. Why didn't you come to school yesterday? I did come to school. I thought he didn't eat meat. He does eat meat. I thought he was a vegetarian. No, you're wrong. He does eat meat. Okay, auxiliary have. No, uh, oh, I don't know how to say your name. Pol Poluzio? Uh, am I even close? Uh, Polugio? Pol I don't know how to pronounce that X in your name. Uh, but So I'm just going to say it the American English way. Poluxio. Uh, can, can you say I did did my homework? No, no. When you have auxiliary do, that's what will take the past form. So if your regular verb is do, it will be the infinitive form. So I did do my homework. You can never say I did did my homework. It's always I did do my homework. The auxiliary will take the past form. That will show the past tense. Yes, Ali, that's right. I did do my homework. Okay, have. Have is used with past participles to make perfect verb forms. Again, have is used with past participles to make perfect verb forms. So, for example, I haven't seen that film yet. That's present perfect simple. How do we know it's present? We have have, H-A-V-E, following I, I have. It's negative with the contracted not, which is an apostrophe T, I haven't seen that film yet. This is verb three. This is our past participle verb. So it'll be verb three. I haven't seen that film yet. She hadn't woken up when I called. This is past. How do I know it's past? Because it has had, which is the past form of have. She hadn't woken up when I called. And then here we have woken up. She hadn't woken up when I called. And then finally, when you get home, I will have already cooked dinner. When you get home, I will have already cooked dinner. This is future. Of course, we have modal will to show future. Then auxiliary have, and then verb three, cooked. Uh, Steve, you're asking, how do we use do, did, or does in a negative way? Steve, just add the not. Didn't, doesn't, don't. I don't, uh, I don't, let's see, what don't, what don't I do? Uh, I don't drink tea. Usually, I don't drink tea. I didn't shave. I didn't shave. He doesn't come to school on time. So 
to use negative auxiliary do, just add the not or the contracted form, the n apostrophe t. Do not, did not, does not, or don't, didn't, doesn't. Good, Anamora. Some people say, I don't understand your lesson, Neil. But thankfully for Anamora, she says, I do understand your lesson very well. Thank you. Uh, that's a good, perfect, present perfect form, Ashley. Ashley wrote the sentence, he has eaten meat in the past. However, he has not eaten meat since. So that's Present perfect simple, both positive and negative. Good sentence, Ashley. Oh, uh, Steve, how to emphasize with the negative. That's a good question, Steve. How to emphasize with the negative. Okay, how to emphasize with the negative would be, he said, uh, What? Uh, let's see. Let's think of something bad. He said, I was drinking at the party, but I didn't drink at the party. So when somebody says you did do something, when somebody says in a positive way you were doing something and you want to correct them by saying you did not do something, you can use the negative do for emphasis. He said, I eat meat, but I don't eat meat. I'm a vegetarian. So you can use the negative don't, didn't, or doesn't for emphasis. If you want to correct somebody, say they're wrong. They say you do something, but you do not do that. Uh, yes, Rosa, that's correct. Uh, have got is more uh, common in British English. Uh, I, have, I have got... Uh, I have got a million dollars. In English, in American English, we'd just say, I have a million dollars. We would not say the have got. Uh, if we feel we have to do something, I have got to clean my room, then we would use it. Followed by an infinitive phrase, then we would use it. I have got to clean my room more often. I have got to start waking up earlier in the morning. So have got a lot more common. Okay. And I'm sorry if I I'm if I'm missing some of your questions. It's going by so fast. Okay. Uh let's look at next. Have or have got can be used for present possession or obligation. Notice the differences. Do you have a car? Yes, I do. Or no, I don't. Have you got Have you got a car? Yes, I have. Or no, I haven't. Uh, I guess we could say this American English again. A, a little strange. Uh, do you have a car? I would probably ask this as an American. As American, I would probably ask this. Do you have a car? Rather than have you got a car? It's fine though, it sounds more formal. Uh, it sounds more formal, have you got a car? Uh, the British might even ask, have you a car? They might drop the got as well. So this form here, the have got for possession, not as common and it sounds, to my ear, it sounds very, very formal, very formal. But it's a simple yes or no question. Yes, I have, or no, I haven't. Does he have to leave? This is obligation. Yes, he does, or no, he doesn't. Has he got to leave? Yes, he has, or no, he hasn't. So if you have an infinitive phrase, if you have an infinitive phrase after the have or the got, then it's fine. You would hear that more often. It's obligation and you would hear that more often. Uh, Gertrude, Gertrudes, uh, I'm not, I don't know if I'm saying your name right, Gertrudes, 
you're late. We're almost done with our lesson on auxiliaries. We're on the last auxiliary verb, have. Uh, Diary, that's a great example sentence. You have got to be kidding. You've got to be kidding. Uh, Mayara, correct. That is a correct sentence. I haven't seen you since last year. Where have you been? That's a correct sentence. Great use of auxiliaries. Diary, yes, we say that all the time. That's a very common expression. You have got to be kidding. You've got to be kidding me. You've got to be kidding me. So actually, we use that one a lot. But that's obligation. Okay, is it? Kind of? It's more of expression, maybe getting more to an idiomatic use. Uh, Ashley got is kind of slang. Uh, many people use the word got incorrectly. Use it when it's not necessary. But it's kind of okay because everybody still understands the message. So it's okay. It's not the worst crime you can commit in grammar to uh, misuse the word got. Doesn't she have a brother? Yes, she does or no, she doesn't. Hasn't she got a brother? Yes, she has or no, she hasn't. Once again, in American English, the, the do question is much more common than the has question, the has got question. We would use the do have question rather than the has got question in American English. Uh, yes, Steve, uh, get got got or get got gotten. Uh, got is also the past form and it can be the past participle form of the verb get. Another difference between American English and British English is get got got or get got gotten. I think, uh, boy, I can't remember which one's British and which one's uh, American now. Uh, both are fine. Got or gotten, both are fine for verb three. Yes, Aaron, I'm working on the homework corrections. Aaron, you're asking for the homework cor corrections at the end, and there's homework for this lesson. So yes, I'll get to those. I know I'm behind. I know I'm behind on my corrections. Give me a little bit of time. Okay, next. These are both possible only in the present tenses. For other tenses, only use have for possession or obligation. For example, past possession. I had a dog when I was young, not I had got a dog. So for the past form, you don't even have to worry about it. Just use had. For future, she will have a job next year. For future, don't worry about it. Just use will have and we have had this teacher for a long time. Okay, this last one's a little strange. This is present perfect possession. I know it's present because auxiliary have is in the present form, have, H-A-V-E, we have. This one, had, is verb three, is verb three, following the auxiliary, oops, following the auxiliary have. We have had this teacher for a long time. This one's your auxiliary verb showing perfect form. And this one, this is possession. So the verb have, when it's not used as an auxiliary, is possession. It means I possess something, I own something. So you can have auxiliary have, and you can have the verb have, meaning possession, in the same sentence together, and you'll have something like this. We have had this teacher for a long time. That's why sometimes for past perfect possession, you can have had had. Sometimes you'll see sentences with had had. I had had this teacher for a long time in the past. Uh, Tatiana, you cannot say, had you have a car? Uh, you can say, have you had a car? Have you had a car? So just switch those two. Have you had a car in the past? Did you ever own a car? Did you ever have the experience of owning a car? 
Have you ever had a car? Uh, she has, yes. So she has, he has, it has, I have, you have, they have, we have. So he, she, and it, the have becomes has. They would like to have a vacation home for when they're retired. Here we have modal would, would like, so we use the infinitive form, the infinitive phrase to have, because we have a modal here. They would like to have a vacation home for when they're retired. And we have verb like, so this is a verb pattern, a verb pattern, like to have. When you have two verbs together in a sentence, that's a verb pattern. You had to be here early, past obligation. Uh, I haven't had much time. Uh, I haven't had much time. So Rosa, we wouldn't say last week. We would say, I haven't had much time this week. I haven't had much time this week. Because it's present, we still have to count now. So it has to be this week. Present, me, present perfect means it's not done. Action is not done. Still going on. I haven't had much time this week. Vivek, when you say, I have a beautiful sister, you're only using it as your main verb. It's not an auxiliary. It's just the main verb. Okay. Uh, let's see. They will have to study harder. Future obligation will auxiliary have infinitive phrase to study. I have had to take the bus to school in the last two months. Present perfect application. Present form of have, our auxiliary have. Past form or verb, not past form, verb three form, uh, past participle form of the verb have, and then infinitive to take. I have had, I have had to take the bus to school in the last two months months. We have more. Okay. Uh, I think I have to end it there. I don't think I'm going to get to the end of the slideshow. We've run out of time. Sorry I had to go so fast. And my apologies if I missed a lot of your questions or example sentences. The chat room was scrolling up like crazy. The chat room was scrolling up like crazy. You wrote so much, you, uh, you asked so many questions, great questions, great example sentences. Hopefully you were able to help yourselves by answering some of those questions. Of course, a big thanks to Rosa and all the other students who are able to answer those questions. Uh, I can't get to them all. What's the point of auxiliaries out there? So important for verb tenses. Don't forget your auxiliaries. When I see examples of student writing, oftentimes I see dropped auxiliaries. They will forget the auxiliaries, especially in continuous forms. Please don't forget your auxiliaries in writing or when speaking. Please find a time to practice. Uh, and thanks again so much for joining me today. And yes, Aaron, uh, there is a homework attached. Look at the bottom of the class notes to see the homework attached. I will get to that. I will get to correcting. Uh, it's gonna have to be Saturday. It'll be on Saturday when you get those, if you can wait that long. For the rest of you, I will see you on Wednesday, next Wednesday, 15.30 Greenwich Mean Time. That's 7.30 a.m. my time here in Washington State in the USA. I hope whatever time it is and wherever you are at in the world, you have a chance to practice your English. Thank you for joining me today, for taking time out of your day for joining me today. Whew, it was a fast lesson, a lot of information. Hope you found something useful. If you missed anything, go to the YouTube channel rewind the video and watch again. And I will see you all 
again very soon in a week. Okay, until then, I'll miss you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Now, stay tuned for a quack, a quack me message. No, a quick message from Sean. Hi, everyone. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe to our channel. Also, if you want the full experience of being a student in a smart live class with things like homework and teacher feedback, follow the link and become a premium subscriber. Also, if you want to see more videos from this class, check out our playlist.